All right. And um, you you will have to forgive me today. I am um, doing both technical facilitation and facilitation facilitation. So there's going to be some bumps as I watch the waiting room and whatnot. But uh, welcome to the call. My name is Shannon Dosmegan, and I'm with the Open Environmental Data Project, but also part of the Open Climate uh, organizing and coordinating team. Um, in the chat, you'll see a link to a Google Doc, I hope. And if not, if somebody could just drop it in there. Um, this is where we're going to be taking notes. Uh, you can also use the Zoom chat if you have comments um, or any technical difficulties. Um, and then in terms of participation, we just ask that you mute if you're not speaking. Um, so let's also just try to, you know, as we go into breakout sessions and as we're uh, doing sharebacks, you know, remember to be kind and considerate. Uh, we are in a, a stressful time in the pandemic um, and want to make sure that we are being respectful of everybody as best we can. All right, um, so just a, a quick synopsis if you've not been on these calls before, um, or perhaps you are, um, you know, an old hat at these as well. Uh, we started doing these calls, um, there's six of us that have been convening them, um, because we wanted to better understand how the open movement can respond meaningfully to the uh, climate crisis. And this is actually our wrap up call today of season one. Uh, so we started in March of this year, uh, and we've done a series of six calls. The other calls calls have uh, primarily been topical. They focus on things ranging from environmental data um, to uh, the, the research of the climate uh, crisis by social scientists to our last call, which was on um, how do we create a fossil free internet by 2030. Uh, so I encourage you all to go to the Apropedia page when you have a second and you know watch the calls if you haven't already um, or check out some of the, the write-ups that we've done on Medium of them um, and read the Open Climate Now article, which appeared in Branch Magazine. So to go ahead and get started, um, I'd like to encourage everybody to um, go into the doc quick and we have an introduction section um, that is about at the bottom of page one. And if you just like to take a minute to go ahead and write your name in, um, this is, you know, as I said, the wrap up of season one. So we are planning on doing a season two, which will probably start sometime in November or December. If you're interested in receiving information going forward, please leave your email address and we will move it over to our contact sheet to make sure that you um, get further updates. So we'll do that for a minute and then we'll just do a very quick round of introductions um, from a couple of people because we have a small group today. Okay, um, we have about one minute so we can try to keep on schedule. Uh, Michelle or Charlie or Tobias, Daniel, uh, Michelle, Emilio, anybody, would you like to do a very quick introduction? So your name, um, perhaps like one sentence on why you're here, and if you want to give an affiliation or a location in the world as well. go first. Hi, everyone. I'm Michelle Tripka. Uh, I use the pronoun she, her. Uh, I'm with the Open Environmental Data Project. Um, I just started last week, so very exciting to be here. Uh, and I'm here because I'm really interested in the way that um, we communicate around climate change and actually incite um, climate action, especially for the communities that um, are most affected by climate change. Great. I guess I'll go next. Hi, I'm Charlie Schweik. I'm a faculty a professor at UMass Amherst. Um, I've been studying uh, common space peer production for about 20 years now uh, and uh, have been thinking about these exact ideas and just by luck ran into Emilio through a mutual contact. And so this is the first time I've seen Emilio face to face, but I'm just thrilled what what you're doing and exciting to hear what you've been talking about. Thanks. Great. And Amherst, Charlie, you're, uh, Emilio's going to be in Boston next week and I'm in Hudson, New York. So you're smack in the middle of us. <laughs> right after Let's the, have a party. Let's meet up. Yeah. <laughs> 
Shannon, I, I th- you may not know me, but I, I was connected with Public Lab for some time. So uh, yeah, it's great to see you. Yeah. 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 Um, anybody else want to do a quick introduction? Well, Daniel here. Um, I'm with the Wikimedia movement um, and trying to do uh, to work on climate related stuff there with sustainability. Um, I'm also a researcher working on uh, ecosystems research, ecological novelty, invasive species, these kind of things, and how uh, in, in biodiversity interacts with uh, climate change. Yeah, I put some bunch of links in the, in the Google Doc. Oh, great. Thank you. We'll take a look after. And maybe one last introduction if somebody is eager. If not, we will go ahead and move on. All right, thank you. And great to great to see some new people. Um, and also, again, of course, um, some faces that have popped up over the last year. Um, so I'm just gonna do a very quick recap of uh, what we've been doing as a community over the last year. And um, then the, the way that we're going to uh, do kind of a, a, a bit more of a deep dive that will lead us into some small breakout sessions um, is I'm gonna um, ask each of the organizers, the people who have been involved in coordinating the community, getting calls going um, to respond to one prompt or two prompts each um, in a way that kind of gets some ideas flowing about what we might do in to the next year and into season two of these calls. Um, so in the to, to start with though, in the last year, um, the open climate community really got its um, kind of legs running, I guess you could say, at the Creative Commons 2020 Summit, which I think happened in October of 2020, um, when uh, SCAN um, and Alex, who are on this call, prompted a session uh, that was called Open Questions in a Warming World. So this was part one of the session. And from that call, several of us met, um, we started to extend our networks, and then we got this original convening group together. We did a part two of this call at MozFest in March of 2021 to start trying to map the space a bit more. Uh, we've also, as a community, written the Open Climate Now article, which I think is linked in the chat, and I would encourage everybody to take a read through respond to um, and also want to mention that we do have an open climate medium page so if people are thinking about these topics and you'd like to write something for the open climate publication uh, we really welcome it uh, you're free to reach out to me or whoever you can grab an email address for uh, that's the best way to get in contact we also did the series of pilot calls. So this is the sixth in uh, the series. And you know, just wanted to start by giving a very warm thank you to all of our speakers, um, one of whom is on our call today, Tobias, who was actually our very first speaker in our very first call, I think back in March or April. So thank you all. I'm gonna pause to give like one of these little emoji things. Yay. All right. Um, and the different, uh, the call topics that we covered included can the open movement contribute to addressing the climate crisis? So the, the big kind of meta question that we started with, how does open data work for decision makers? What content gaps are the um, open movement missing in relation to the climate crisis? What are the challenges of openness in environmental research of the climate crisis? And then how can the open internet dismantle the power structures that, dis, uh, that delay climate action. Um, so this was a, a broad stretch of conversations. And I think, you know, speaking from somebody who was on all of them, um, I feel like we were able to reach out to a lot of different organizations, organizers, people who are um, interested in a lot of different facets of this topic to kind of understand what people are already doing, where they're thinking. Uh, but the community certainly continues to grow. Uh, every time I'm in a new space myself, you know, I feel like we have people that are like, oh, this open climate thing you all are working on, what is it? Um, so hence why we will continue this and why we're going to go into another series of community calls. Um, over those five calls, we had about 106 people that attended. Uh, we had lots of people that were here for multiple drop-ins, but many more that came uh, because the topic was of interest to them. Um, and we have a lot of people who are interested in organizing for the upcoming call series uh, on topics ranging from grassroots organizing and the application of open um, to thinking about unions, open source, and the climate crisis. Um, but now we're wrapping up season one. And so I want to go into uh, talking with my colleagues. Um, and I'm going to start with Scan. 
uh, who is listed as Evelyn today. But um, so I have a prompt for everybody based on what I know about them and their work. And I'm hoping from each of you for about three minutes of response. Uh, and for people who are listening, if you have additional questions, please feel free to ask them, but um, also using this conversation kind of a spotter to go into our breakout session. So scan, um, quoting from the Open Climate Now article, climate movement activists and advocates are re-examining their power relations and grappling with historical exclusions of people because of race, gender, class, or geographic origin. This call for change is also happening in the open movement, which advocates for liberating access to the historical body of intellectual resources, such as art, literature, research, and other expressions that we call the knowledge commons. In short, we believe that knowledge must be shared in order for humanity to survive and thrive, and that it's essential to help fight the climate crisis. So can you tell me from your perspective how we get there? First, I have no idea. <laughs> That's like the short answer to that. And I think that part of the reason why we're doing these community calls is actually to explore that question, right? Like, how do we get there? Because we don't necessarily have like a clear roadmap on that. And so I think that part of what we want to do is kind of like create and shape the communities that we want, that we want to see, and how do we want to see them, right? I think that this is like, one of the interesting things of the climate open climate group has been that we are like gathering people from all over the place, at least that are near in our time zones, right? Because it's always hard to engage with people from uh, other continents. Um, but yeah, I think that we 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 need to create the, and shape the communities that we want. Uh, we need to understand what we could do better. Um, and why is this critical now? And, you know, it's like, it's not necessarily like reconning all the time or like, you know, going around all the hurt that was done in the past, but sort of understand what has gone wrong and what we could do better. And more important than anything, having fun with others. <laughs> like that's the main thing that we have been exploring as we try to understand what to do for season two. And, um, and I was speaking with someone yesterday and like this person was like, fun, fun. Whenever you're doing like something as a volunteer, like the joy that you get out of it, it's even more important that the end goal that you might have um, for, for that is not always like this transactional thing, like, oh, we need to do X, Y, Z, but also like we need to enjoy the process. And, and I think that's an important part of it. Thanks. And um, for you, why open climate community and why now? Well, I've been saying this over and over, but like there's no running there. I don't, I cannot think on a more important topic to be working on right now. I think this is like, basically, we, we all feel that way. This is like an existential threat to humanity in a lot of ways. And um, investing your time in doing anything else might not be like the best thing that you can be doing right now. So that's kind of how I feel. Okay. Luis Philippe, on to you. So during the June open climate call, you brought two unique perspectives to the space through the people you invited to interrogate the framework of openness applied to social science research of the climate crisis. Can you tell us about your work on translating the open movement into environmental research of the climate crisis? Where are we succeeding and where are we stumbling? Um, thank you, Shannon. Um... I think uh, we can summarize, uh, I think, in two main threads. Um, I think the first one uh, was the topic of uh, call number three with Mayana Lassen and, and Silvio Carlos. And it has to do with this idea that um, in, in terms of research, environmental research, social research and activism in Brazil, they managed to create something called the social environmental uh, perspective. And this is something really powerful that was, you know, happening in Brazil, like after Rio 92. And it's part of a, of, of a movement to think about social and environmental issues together, right? And it has been very powerful. So I think part of the influence in uh, the direction uh, comes from this influence of the social environmental perspective. The second thread, which has to do with this work of translation is one that is more conceptual and com comes from anthropology which is the ecological paradigm. And it has been, de been developed by different anthropologists like Isabel Carvalho, Roberto Stael, uh, Tim Ingold, um, um, Otavio Velho, and many others. 
And the basic idea there is that you uh, historically, uh, we have been working with uh, the domain of uh, uh, the environment as nature and society and culture as two separated domains. And the same applies for, for when we think about the problems that we have in, in the free and open source movement and in technology in general, we separate the technical from the social, right? So this perspective helps us a lot to deal with the problems that we have in, in thinking about uh, open environmental data and creating communities around it and the importance of combining free and open source activism and development with the environmental issues that we're dealing with. So in terms of the work that I've been doing and what I've, I have seen, um, I think uh, we have come a long way. So. There's one domain that I think we're moving uh, almost uh, frictionless, <laughs> and I'm very optimistic about this, is that I think in terms of the free and open source tools uh, and technologies that we have and approaches that we have for developing uh, scientific um, um, software and digital infrastructures, it's there. So we have, uh, we have been doing well, and I think we have like a, a big a number of tools, we have good, vibrant communities, and what I think it's interesting is that we also have managed to get some funders, big funders, to be on our side in terms of, of, of um, um, uh, creating incentives for data sharing and supporting the development of scientific tools that are commons based, right? So I think that domain is something we made progress. But now where we didn't make progress and I think we're still struggling with has to do with our capacity to work in interdisciplinary teams. I think we still have a lot of friction and pushback in working with the social and environmental perspectives combined. Uh, and, and this is something, again, if we go back to the two threads I was talking about, the social environmental and the ecological paradigm, I think those help us uh, 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 deal with this problem of the separation that we feel, still feel between people who, st who study the geophysical uh, characteristics of a particular environment and people who are doing social studies of the people who inhabit that environment that is being studied. Um, that separation, I think it's extremely negative for the future of our communities. And I think we, we, can, we can bypass that. We can, we can move, not bypass, we, we can find a solution for it. Great. And again, uh, for you, why open climate and why now? Um, I think, um, well, I, I think there's an urgency um, for all of us when it comes to environmental, the question of, of climate change, that it's not, it's, it's not a matter of choice, right? We, we don't ha really have a choice. We, we all have to be working on it, whether we like it or not, whether it is something that is really close to what we do or not, right? So that's the now, the urgency. The time is, is now or, or never, right? Like it needs to be, to be happen now. And in terms of the open climate, again, it's, 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 it's this sense that we, we've come a long way as a community. Charlie was talking about in the beginning, like about his 20 years of research in free and open source technologies. We come a long way in terms of doing research and developing the technologies. Now we need to get that community and, and, and what we learn and, and find ways and, and inter, uh, interfaces with the climate um, research and activism. So I think that's, that's, that's what motivates me. I think that's what motivates all of us. But I think that's kind of like the, the horizon, right? That we're working towards. Great, thank you. All right, uh, Michelle, my friend, Michelle Thorne, the other Michelle. Hello, yeah, two Michelles on a call. Yeah. <laughs> um, great. Yeah, I was gonna say, I, I really like you both, so I'm glad you're both here. Um, the August Open Climate Call is, or was, I'm sorry, focused on how we create a fossil-free internet by 2030. Why is this framework so important in the context of open climate? And what is one recommendation for how we achieve this goal? Yeah, thank you. It's super nice to reflect on this. And um, I guess thinking about a fossil free internet made me really also re-engage with like why the open movement is important too. And why I also think an open internet is essential to um, for the climate crisis. And I think it comes back to power. So I think ultimately openness or open practices are like an amazing tool to, to shift and redistribute power. Um, and we've seen that like in the knowledge common space, but I also think we increasingly need to see that um, in the internet space where a handful of tech companies basically um, are consolidating like 
internet life and making a shit ton of money. Um, and they're not only consolidating like internet infrastructure, but down to the energy and um, like all from like the, you know, raw minerals to production to like uh, serving up data to con- like training the data. And all, like, it's just like, it's just kind of crazy the consolidation that's going on. And so when I think about a fossil free internet, I, the other word I insert sometimes is like free, fossil free and open internet. Um, and I think this is part of like, we're not going to be successful in a world if we just decarbonize the existing system. We're still going to have like a terrible extractive neoliberal order. Um, and so we need things like openness at the heart of what we're rebuilding so that it's more equitable, um, more access and um, people have options and right the ability to opt out or participate on their own terms. Um, and so that was what, what I've been really inspired in about like having these conversations with you all is like how to link the calls, like maybe kind of nerdy technical call for a fossil free internet, but to link it to these other, um, you know, social, political and environmental issues. Great. And again, um, for you, why open climate and why now? Yeah, I plus one to what Louise and Scan were saying about the, just the urgency of action. Um, and I found just personally, I don't, I mean, I'm sure all of you have gone through ver- versions of of climate grief and paralysis. And um, I realized for me, the best anecdote to feeling despair was action. Um, And so even if we don't always know what's right or what's gonna be most effective, like even just showing up and thinking about it and doing that in the open has already like given a sense of like possibility and made me, got me out of despair and into some sort of like, like let's grab optimism and and make it work for us. Um, and I, yeah, I think that it's the, the climate crisis, it's not like a single issue. It's, it's a whole era. It's happening now. It has been happening. It's going to be happening for the next generations. And so if we need to bring all the most effective tools we have to doing that, and I think openness is one of the underutilized ones and one that I have hope for (laughs) us yielding effectively. Great. All right, on to Alex. Um, so again, this is a, a quote from uh, the Open Climate Now article. The communities in critical need of knowledge about the climate crisis require information and languages that the commercial internet will never prioritize, but that are currently supported by free and open source platforms like Wikipedia and OpenStreetMap. Can you tell me how you're thinking about centering the importance of multiple knowledge systems and languages in the work of Open Climate? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, first, you know, starting in places like OpenStreetMap and Wikimedia, the platforms themselves support the languages, right? And we already have communities there. And so the question is, like, how do we reach and talk to those communities? And part of that is broadcasting and, like, international languages that are used for kind of sharing, right? Uh, maybe it's Arabic, maybe it's French, maybe it's English. Um, and in getting organizers and people in context who better understand what that language needs. Uh, so our when we ran Wiki for Human Rights this last year um, uh, with UN Human Rights, it was focused on right to a healthy environment. And our community in the Philippines, for example, ran four events in different languages, right? That were focused on like, okay, is the, the Philippines is most affected by sea level rise and these human rights issues and deforestation and drawing those connections, right? Um, So I think part of it is bringing new leaders uh, into the conversation that aren't just of the dominant internet culture, right? Uh, um, And open communities have those leaders, right? Wikimedia communities organize in at least 100 languages. Um, You know, we have content in 300, but like the active communities are there. Um, People are there, they're working in the open like language preservation happens in the open right now. Um, And so we need to kind of listen carefully, ask those communities, you know, what kinds of gaps are most important for your context, and then really just create the space for folks to do it. Um, Does that answer your question? (laughs) Yeah. And could you, uh, could you tell me for yourself why open climate and why now? Oh, I mean, this is a all hands on deck world problem, right? Uh, and like every single person 
needs to be here. I think the, the quote from the UN was uh, code red for humanity. Um, and it's not just like the climate crisis, right? It's, it's pollution, it's the biodiversity crisis, it's COVID, it's the socioeconomic kind of disaster we're creating with this current economic system, right? All of these things uh, need and must have a, a backbone of knowledge and a shared understanding of what's happening in the world, right? Uh, and for better or worse, uh, like the open communities have created much of that backbone for the internet. And I think we just need to be really conscious of the power that that brings, right? Um, and we need to show up <laughs> now with that power in a way that's constructive rather than just kind of like uh, doing, I think, which is often the fallacy of open communities, which is like, hey, it's open, you can use it, but providing no accessibility and no like conscious support for the communities that most need that support, right? Um, and, and this is the equity move we need to make <laughs> and we need to be conscious of it and we need to be intentional and we need to create space for, for the people who need it most. Great. All right, and finally, last but not least, Emilio. Uh, I guess at the April 2021 conversation you led, uh, Ana Grijalva from UNDP Accelerator Lab in Ecuador said something that struck all of us as central to an effective open climate solution. All of the outputs of open climate need to be relevant to the smallest possible policymaker and participant, not just big institutions. The smallest uh, policymaker may mean a farmer who doesn't speak a dominant language but controls acres of forest uh, needed for maintaining our global carbon balance. It could mean a local but supportive politician who has never seen the messy side of data wrangling or a youth activist who won't become an intellectual property or an intellectual property wonk at some point in the future. We don't want to repeat the mistake of earlier environmental movements um, and international development of doing policy and uh, creating half-conceived solutions without those who are most at risk for being affected by climate change rather than with them. Emilio, can you talk about how you envision designing the whole open stack alongside the smallest possible policymaker? Hard question. <laughs> um, but the one thing I can, you know, like I, I've been thinking about a lot is about participation. And when we envision participation in international development, in the open movement, um, sometimes we leave aside the idea that for good participation to occur, there has to be mutual influence. So um, these spaces that we're creating have to be open uh, for the influence of people who are the smallest or the persons who are uh, being affected specifically in this case by climate change, by uh, lack of access to knowledge. And yeah, there has to be uh, first cultural, no intellectual humility on behalf of uh, many different communities who are holding this knowledge right now in order to understand the needs of uh, different people from different parts of the world and not take those things for granted. Um, so that's one. Then the other has to do with uh, common credit narratives that come from top to bottom and to start creating these narratives that really show how big policies or big decisions um, about funding, about uh, projects can affect the smallest uh, of communities and you know, like the, the real impact, which is very difficult to uh, measure. So there has to be funding into that. Um, and then I think it's also important to start thinking about uh, the small wins in terms of openness in climate change which are not too sexy sometimes for funders to say, hey, you know, we, uh, we're creating this intervention in this small community and this is happening through the use of data, et cetera. Because sometimes we want to see scale and we're, uh, especially in the knowledge in the common society, we're used to having big numbers, uh, a million of whatever being built, et cetera. Uh, but we have to start at small and, and embrace that diversity that comes with it. 
Great. And final wrap up, uh, the same that I've asked everybody for you, why open climate and why now? Um, because our narratives now are based on knowledge and a person who does not have access to knowledge does not have access to, to the narratives to make changes or to be part of them. So in that sense, openness is a core value that has to be embraced by different social justice movements. And the, I think that the open movement has lived enough that we start to understand that we are supporting other uh, values, other causes, and that we are an important part uh, that can bring value to all of these people who are on the field, who are policymakers, who are scientists, etc. So, so yeah, I think um, the mission of the open movement has to start shifting towards serving it to be useful and to to be supportive of all of these uh, because uh, all of these causes are the ones that are creating real social change. And in the case of uh, climate change, are the ones that are uh, keeping us from destroying humanity. So they're kind of important. All right, thank you. And um, I appreciate all of you um, for leading calls over the last year and bringing really interesting people into the room. Um, it has been fascinating to say the least. And again, I encourage others to take a look through um, the Open Climate Archives when you have a minute. Um, in a uh, trick of facilitation multitasking, I have put together two different breakout rooms um, as Amelia wrapped up his last question while also listening <laughs> intently. No, just kidding. Um, thank you. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and we're going to jump into breakouts. Uh, we're going to shorten it to about 10 minutes. So there'll be four of you in one group, five of you in the other group. And we have three questions as prompts. Uh, so the first is what resonated, if you've been on calls from the, the any of the last five calls, what what resonated with you from the past conversations or um, what resonated with you from what you just heard uh, from the, the five speakers? Second, what would you like to see in season two? Dream big. Uh, we are looking for really interesting topics. If you have people to suggest, you know, please bring those suggestions as well. Um, if you have things outside of calls that you'd like to suggest, this is also a great place to uh, put them out. Um, and then finally, is there a role you'd be interested in playing in open climate? Um, for instance, would you like to organize a call? Would you like to volunteer to help do technical facilitation on some of these um, so that I'm not jumping all over the place? Uh, so, you know, again, think creatively and we will go ahead. Actually, I'm going to admit one more person so I can get her into a breakout room as well. Um, and then we will see everybody back in approximately 10 minutes or so. Um, all right. And uh, so the person joining us is Camille and Alex and Emilio, she's going to be in your group. So if you could just kind of give her a heads up on um, what you all are doing, that would be fantastic. Okay. And I'm opening rooms. All right. Welcome back. There is never enough time for all the things that we want to talk about. This I know to be true. <laughs> All right, um, so why don't we start with just a, a quick, um, you know, if you have something to add, um, any thoughts that came up based on the conversation we just had on this call or past conversations? Um, and I'll start with group one, which is the uh, Alex and Emilio's group. All right, um, so many things. <laughs> Yeah, so, so I, I think the conversation um, was around very specific things. Let me see the first one. Um, I think Camille was uh, mentioning something around knowledge creating specific impact for, uh, in general, like how to the policy level we can see what is the impact being created. I think that's uh, around the lines of what uh, you were mentioning. Uh, and that there was not an IP framework to preserve heritage equally. Um, and, and then Charlie was saying something about that this is not an exercise, an academic uh, thing to ponder about, but rather something that's calling us to action. And that you know, we have to start thinking about this and he could see that in the discussions that we had. Uh, we are having sort of a very similar mindset, right, about things that have to happen now. Um, and 
And you know that that disconnects. Also, Michelle was talking about the disconnect between how we use the internet and material elements of using the internet, right? So, so that it's nice to have spaces where we can talk about these things. And then, in general, what uh, we would like to see in season two is about design global, manufacturing local. You know, like all of this mindset of distributed manufacturing, how this can be applied to climate change and more explicit connection with solidarity building, organizing groups that are doing the work. Um, and then there were uh, a couple of uh, persons that were very interested in collaborating with us on season two and very specific actions. So yeah, leave it there. All right, great. Um, and before I pass it over to group two, if you if you did drop a note in that says something like, I would like to um, help organize the Open Climate Party, uh, just leave your name as well so that we know who you are and how to follow up with you. Um, okay, so group two, which was the uh, Luis Philippe, Michelle, and SCAN group. Why don't we just go, um, any, any responses that you'd like to provide? Um, things that resonated from this call or previous calls and what would you like to see in season two? And this is open to the entire group. It doesn't have to be one of the organizers. Yeah, I think it, 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 like um, something that appeared also as well in a uh, recent uh, gathering <laughs> around how we can uh, open and help uh, fight greenwashing. Um, I think that was an interesting um, takeaway. And, you know, uh, people were saying that they felt drawn to some of the goals because of the topics and some of the people, but that doesn't necessarily mean that open climate uh, needs to be yet another group. And so how can we better integrate um, the conversations that we're having with already existing groups? Um, and there were some ideas for season two, sorry, uh, particularly around formats um, and maybe, you know, uh, trying to think some more hands-on activities. I think that's um, something that people are um, wanting. Also, like uh, co-hosting an open climate festival or some time of, of, uh, of fun activity, <laughs> um, maybe some workshop or um, uh, things like that. So I think that's uh, the summary of uh, some of the things that we discussed. Uh, and please, folks, feel free to jump in. Anyone else from any of the groups, uh, contributions, thoughts on the, the calls or specific things that you'd like to see going forward with Open Climate Community? Okay. If not, um, then again, I'll encourage you, especially whoever just said they would like to um, do a workshop on the role of open source and in ESG investment. That sounds fascinating. And I don't know who you are, so please make sure to leave your name. Um, and I'm going to pass it over to Scan, who has some thoughts on next, next steps and what to expect from us. Well, <laughs> I guess that the first next step is that we are not aiming to create yet another new open group of the sorts. So for the person that was raising that concern, I think it was Daniel, like we can say, no, we are not planning on doing that. Um, but we do think that there's some work uh, to be done around some type of coalition building. Um, I'm thinking more uh, how we can invite others and what are exactly the sort of things that um, we want to get out from these conversations. Um, but um, and so we are still like working with that with the um, a little more of a close group. Um, but if you want to like, you know, um, um, get in touch or get updated, um, the first thing is, of course, like following along the uh, hashtag Open Climate on Twitter. Um, and we'll be back for season two of Open Climate Calls. Um, probably we're going to change the format of some of this to make them more hands-on and less like a speaker presenting uh, something. Um, but if you would like to organize one, uh, give a, a short talk or generally get involved with the group, um, just uh, get in touch with us. Um, and I'll also leave my email there on the chat so you can um, contact me if you're interested. Um, in organizing a, a talk or give a short talk. Um, and of course, we have the medium, as Shannon said. So if you want to write about open climate, 
um, please um, get in touch. We have a publication uh, page there that we could like pull some information. Um, and yeah, probably early mid November, sometime around there, we are planning to have an open climate party. Um, this is definitely something that <laughs> everything seems to signal that we're going to try to like have something more fun and engaging. Um, so not that we didn't have fun before, but we probably need to change a little bit the format. Um, so yeah, that, that's pretty much it. All right. Well, I am happy to give everybody seven minutes back of their time before you head off to your day and your next engagement. But thank you again uh, to all of the conveners of this season and these calls and to people who joined us today, to previous speakers. Um, it has been a real pleasure to start figuring out what this open climate community looks like. So until next time, we'll be taking a pause in October, um, but we will hopefully reconvene and see all of you at some point in November. You have Scan's email address, so feel free to reach out in the meantime and make sure you leave your email address if you'd like to get direct communication from us on future events. All right, thank you everybody.